Well, thank you and welcome to the third in our three-part series of preparing for the academic job market. Today we're going to talk about um, the negotiation and uh, I have with me today Professor Amy Throckmorton from Drexel who I'm going to introduce in a minute because she's going to do the main portion of the presentation today and then we have plenty of time for questions. I do want to remind people, oh, I do want to remind people that I forgot to update the cover slide because it's supposed to say how to negotiate for an academic faculty position. And that's our, our discussion for today. We had two others that are available on YouTube if you're interested. And uh, if you can't get the link here, I'd be happy to send it out. Um, so just feel free to email me whenever and I'm happy to send it. I do want to give a, a short recap of how we've been doing this series and why it's set up the way it is and why we're ending with the offer part. And so as those of you who participated before know that we had started thinking about how do you actually get to the application. I want to remind you that, uh, and we had talked about this back in July, that we were concerned that there were not going to be a lot of position announcements this year. And in my personal experience being on listservs and things of that nature, I think sadly it's true. I personally have not seen the number of faculty announcements that I would have expected to see by October 1. I know in July we discussed it, we had talked about perhaps PhD students thinking about if their advisor still had funding, perhaps staying a little bit longer in their PhD programs, especially if you're doing some kind of human subject work and it's difficult to collect the data, to spend the time to think about how you could do a study remotely or doing some other kind of work and trying to delay a year. I also mentioned that postdocs might be a good option for people. It turns out faculty are still writing grants and getting grants and having some opportunities for postdocs. So I do want to say closing that loop from July 30 till today. Um, I wish I were wrong back in July, uh, but it doesn't seem like the number of ads are very great. Um, it might mean that next year is a banner year though. And so um, there may be many, many announcements next year. But we did talk about, uh, you know, how to get to that application. And the second uh, talk was really about helping you get to the telephone interview and the campus interview. And again, we have the YouTube video on that. But I do want to make the point here that that process is also probably going to be different in the COVID environment. So before COVID, uh, we would have a search committee. They would down select for the telephone interview. It's not really usually a telephone interview, it may be on Zoom or something like that. Uh, but then there would be a down select and there would be a campus interview. In the post COVID era, in the, the post COVID era, I don't know how campus interviews are going to happen. It may turn out that there are distance interviews and you give a talk using you know, Zoom or something like that. And it could be that your meetings are done over Zoom. So the notion that you're actually going to the campus for the interview may or may not happen. Personally, I think it's really important to visit somewhere before you go. You get a much better sense of what it's like to live somewhere and the culture on the other hand, visiting a place that's shut down, you're not going to get that feeling. <laughs> so it is a, a very difficult issue. On the campus interview, if there is one, or on the remote campus interview, it is possible that the department head or the dean will start the negotiation process. And I mentioned this last time. The, that means that you need to be prepared for the information that you're going to get today earlier. You, you can't wait until you have the interview and then wait till you get the offer 
to start thinking about the negotiation. And although generally the offer and the negotiation would happen after a campus interview, if they're really serious about you, they may start negotiating with you during the interview process. I wanna say one very positive thing, which is if there are universities who have money to hire, they are gonna to try to snag the best people they possibly can now because they know that they're the ones that have funding and ability to bring faculty in and they may wanna close the deal very quickly. So another reason to be prepared for the negotiation. But typically there'd be the campus interview and then the next steps would be getting your offer together, which will include a negotiation that Professor Amy Throckmorton is going to talk to you about today. So I'm gonna stop my presentation there to save time for Professor Throckmorton. And while she's bringing up her slides, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Amy Throckmorton. So uh, Dr. Throckmorton is someone that we would call a triple who. That is a person who has gotten their BS, their MS, and their PhD all from the University of Virginia. However, her undergraduate degree is in chemical engineering, while her master's and her PhDs are in biomedical engineering. Because Professor Throckmorton is so multidisciplinary, her first uh, academic position after her postdoc uh, at Indiana University School of Medicine was actually in a department of mechanical and nuclear engineering at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond. And then she joined the faculty at Drexel in the School of Biomedical Engineering Science and Health Systems in 2013. Professor Throckmorton has won numerous awards, including the university's best uh, professor award. She's an excellent instructor. She's also uh, been uh, running uh, several research programs, mostly in pediatric engineering, thus the cover slide you're looking at right now. <laughs> um, but she's also been involved in a lot of leadership opportunities and leadership training. But today, Professor Throckmorton is going to talk to you because she is a fierce negotiator. And with that, uh, let me turn it over to you. Well, I'd just like to thank Dr. Bass for the opportunity to be here. I hope all of you can, can hear me okay. Everybody's good? Good. Oh, yep. Awesome. So it's a pleasure to be here and I do love negotiating. I know that sounds kind of odd, but if I could negotiate uh, anything from like the store, the grocery store, I would just enjoy that. Uh, so it's something I, I, I definitely, uh, whenever I have an opportunity, to negotiate, I definitely try to step up and, and improve my skills in that regard. And I would like to underscore what Dr. Bass said about how the interview and the negotiation process, when you're on campus or during the interview, um, they actually pivoted with me at lunch. I started negotiating my position and what my needs would be with a department chair. They had already made a decision that they were going to give me an offer. And as a result of that, you know, I think it's, uh, I think it is important to have a list in mind when you're part of that campus interview, because you never know when they're going to start saying, okay, well, what will it take to bring you here to VCU? And in my case, that happened uh, quite, quite early on. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and I'm going to go through the talk and I'm going to make this as real as possible and really give you as much advice as I, I can possibly do during this, this time frame. And you can also feel free to email me or even uh, text me if, if you have any questions. We can, we can talk after this. Um, so in first, I'm going to talk about the general aspects of, the, of a faculty position. I know you've probably gone over this, but think about it through the lens of negotiating the position. Uh, the financial package, the research startup support, uh, teaching and service loads are a very important part of that discussion when you're trying to protect your time for research. Uh, which is really how they're going to measure you to some degree and your success on a tenure track. Um, aspects of related to quality of life, you know, we definitely need to pause and look at that when you're negotiating and making decisions about positions, uh, potential leave, and even professional development opportunities. You really should prioritize these and determine which ones are most important uh, to you as you look at negotiation and how to negotiate the best position for you moving forward. 
Okay, so general aspects of the position. So right out of the gate, you really need to step back and look at this in a different way. Everyone wants to be liked, you want to be hired, you know, you don't want to rock the boat right out of the gate. But when you're negotiating that position, this is a time when you really need to ask for what you need to be successful. So it is a moment where you need to go for it. Um, and to be quite honest, they're going to expect that to some degree, but you need to be somewhat assertive in asking for your needs. You have to advocate for yourself and lobby for what you need to be successful. Okay, because um, keep in mind on the administrator side, they want to curtail spending, right? So they're going to try to kind of pull back a little bit. And so you really, really need to advocate for yourself. It's, it's important. And quite frankly, in a year or so, they really will not remember um, that, that kind of pushback and this sort of experience that, that you have. Um, if somehow you perceive that it, it may be looked upon you in an unfavorable fashion. So again, you need to be successful and you need to ask for what, you know, to be successful, ask for what you need. So everyone thinks of salary startup and students when they think about a faculty position negotiation. And yes, these are definitely three really important categories to consider. Um, but I would also encourage you, to data mine, talk to as many faculty as you can. Myself, Dr. Bass, your advisors, any other faculty that you can engage in a conversation, ask them about their negotiation experience. Ask them for strategies that they used. And then you can meld that into your approach, right? And prioritize a wish list. And you have to think about it too through the lens of the administrator. So you want every item on your wish list for research, uh, for travel, for really whatever you, you think you need to be successful, to get tenure, to continue to build the research program at that university. Um, you want it to be justified and you want it to be value add. And again, from an administrator's perspective, it is value add to your research program, but also think about how you can make a case for it to be a value add for the, for the program, for the department, for the school, perhaps for the university. Think of the school's mission, think of the department's mission, and how will this help to achieve that mission? So think beyond just your research program. And ultimately, you want a win-win contract arrangement, right? You're going to get some of what you need. And then, of course, they're going to be able to um, basically satisfy their needs on, on the financial side, right? You're not going to get everything that, that you're going to ask for. Um, I would encourage you to think about when you're going to start as part of your negotiation process. Um, I have seen faculty come in like in the spring term. Um, and as a result, you need to know, well, does that affect my tenure clock, right? Um, because tenure clocks have certain calendar dates where they're deadlines. So if you come in a little later into an academic year, does that mean you have a shorter amount of time associated with your, you know, five or six years on the tenure clock? So it is important. I would strongly recommend that you try to come in at the beginning of an academic year, okay? Because it puts you on track with everybody else and it puts you really in line with whatever that, that, that calendar clock is for the tenure review process. So it's very important uh, to think about that. The type of contract in the negotiation is also important. Um, whether you're at a research intensive institution or if teaching is prioritized in, in a different way as an R1, for instance. And so you wanna think about that as you approach, it, uh, approach the negotiation. Um, most tenure track positions are for six years. A lot of uni universities have been pivoting to provide these three year contracts. So they'll give you a contract for three years with of course annual reviews um, and then do a mid tenure review. And then you'll get a final three year contract to finish out the tenure clock. Okay, which is a six year duration. It's kind of like getting, you know, partner in a law firm in a way. But keep in mind, though, that what you really want is a full six year contract that three years um, sometimes doesn't give you enough time, depending upon your research. I've seen faculty just exponentially soar after that mid tenure review, right? They weren't all that successful initially in the three years because it's nanotech. Um, depending upon the research field, it's really hard to get started. It takes a few years to build that program. Um, but then all of a sudden it just takes off and they're extremely successful with publications, uh, with presentations, with students graduating and with funding as well. So if you can get a six year, a full six year tenure track, um, you know, time frame in, in your contract, I would highly recommend that. 
I would probably prioritize that if it, if it were me. Try to avoid those three-year contracts. I think they can be distracting and you really want a commitment on their end for that full 10-year clock right out of the gate, okay? Um, so now let's talk about some of the financial aspects. Academic salary, I had a lot of questions about this. Find out what you're worth. You need to know what you're worth, okay? And again, those are conversations with faculty. Uh, you can find information on the Chronicle of Higher Education. The AAUP puts out publications on faculty salaries uh, uh, almost every year. So look at that information. Learn really what you should be asking for. Um, also keep in mind, public universities publish their salaries online. They're readily available. Um, and if you can't get last year's, you can definitely get the years, you know, the year before. So I would look at those assistant professor positions and I would really study up to know what you're worth. Okay, as, as you're conceptualizing uh, what you're going to ask for, or even when they make an offer to you, are they trying to lowball you, or are they actually providing you with a reasonable competitive uh, offer on your salary? Also, think about the tenure track uh, appointment. You know, you've got nine months, which is your academic appointment, and then three months in the summer. And normally you would pay for your, your summer funding out of research grants would be the goal. Okay, so, so think about that, the salary they're offering you, understand, you know, how they're conceptualizing that as well. Is it um, the nine month appointments, you know, how are they defining that in whatever offer letter they provide to you. Okay, so nine months, and then of course your three months of, of summer salary is usually on top of that base salary. Now, when it comes to summer salary, it is not unusual for incoming faculty to actually get some supplemental funding for their summer. So request four to six months of summer salary. Um, and what they'll do is they'll try to confine the time frame. You can use that. They may say, well, you can have two months of summer coverage for your first year, right? Um, but in actuality, if you hit a grant, you know, you'd rather have those expenditures. You'd rather spend the grant out. Um, so you don't want to use it or lose it kind of situation. You want to try and have as much flexibility as possible. Uh, it only benefits you and it only makes you uh, better as a faculty and more committed to the university as well. So I would ask for four to six months to use as you wish over your tenure period. Uh, that's a pretty lofty ask, but you could still ask for it. Um, and you can negotiate this as, as a point, um, maybe the first three years or something like that, but you know, not a use it or lose it within your first year. Uh, you, you can ask for some flexibility in that regard and you should, you are worth it. So know what you're worth uh, when you get into this negotiation uh, step. Benefits package, you should look into the university. They have a lot of information online that can educate you about what their life insurance, disability, retirement benefits, any health related benefits that they have. Um, look into that. It's important for you to know what they're offering you as far as a benefits package. Relocation expenses. So if you're moving to California from Philadelphia, for instance, uh, that could be pretty expensive. So $10,000 or $15,000 may not be an extraordinary ask uh, for, for you to consider. Um, and my suggestion is to call a moving company. Get an estimate from them on how much you would need to relocate. Um, and then also think about the university. They have moving companies that are already part of their network. Um, you know, if you consider procurement, for instance, they have moving companies. And so maybe looking or finding out or asking who they are uh, so that you can contact them to have a better understanding of relocation expenses. One thing to consider is if they cut you a check for $10,000 for relocation, it is possible that depending upon how it's defined, it's considered taxable income. So you need to be very careful about that. Um, I would actually have the university pay the moving company directly so that they don't cut you a check and there's no issue uh, from an accounting perspective as to whether that's considered taxable. Because for instance, if they cut you a check for 10,000 um, and it really costs you $9,500 to move, uh, but you have to pay taxes on that $10,000, you have actually lost money uh, related to the move. So let the university do it and, uh, and you know, make sure that there's an option for you, for you, for you to do that. Um, so let's consider service and teaching loads, which again is very important, especially coming in as an assistant professor. Uh, certainly they're usually department school or university committee service. So you really do wanna think about 
how to protect your time for research. If you're going into uh, research one, you know, uh, research intensive institution, you really want to have limited to no service, um, you know, pretty much for, for your whole tenure clock if you can, but definitely in the first two years, I would protect your time as much as, as you possibly can. Um, and with that in mind, if you do need to, you know, if your department chair or your dean or whomever really wants you to do some service, I would offer to serve on the graduate committee. And the reason I would do this is from a research perspective, you're going to see all the applications of students coming in and it gives you a window into the caliber of students, the possibility of being able to recruit students maybe a little bit earlier than some of the other faculty. And it also gives you the opportunity to advocate for your research um, as they talk about priorities for research in the graduate committee. Um, so give lots of different chances in that regard. So I would recommend the graduate committee um, if you are going to do, do any service at all in the first two years. Um, strategically become active in a professional society. Um, and I know this doesn't have anything to do with your negotiation, but it's just a strategy. And the reason I would do this instead of really departmental or school university service is those external review letters are really important during the tenure review. And so if you can have protected time, if you can have a department chair um, that understands this and you have that conversation during the negotiation, um, it's, it's important, those external review letters. So, so step up in a professional society, uh, become a leader, get your reputation out there, um, let them learn about your research, see your commitment to advancing the field, and it only helps you as you move through uh, the tenure track process. Teaching load. My suggestion is definitely have a, a reduced load for the first year, and this is definitely, this is common practice. Um, I would ask for no teaching in your first year. Um, now, they're probably not going to give this to you, uh, but you can lobby for it. If it's a priority for you, then you can ask for it and you can lobby for it if there's pushback. Um, you are likely to receive teaching relief in your first or second semester or, you know, depending upon your, if it's a quarter system, maybe two quarters out of three. Um, and then you'd have a reduced load, perhaps. And one other thing you want to consider is, what are the class sizes? Well, they want you to teach graduate courses or undergraduate courses. Um, so think about the specificity of all of that. It's important. Well, classes of greater than 50 students count as two courses, right? And so if you have a really big class, you kind of want that to count as two classes as opposed to just one. Um, well, classes of greater than 30 students in a lab session count as two courses. And again, some of this is based on the university and, and the course size and, you know, um, all of that and how they make decisions on teaching load. But you can actually include some of this in your contract letter. You can be very specific uh, depending upon how you want to approach it. So be strategic in that you want to try to keep your classes every year. Okay, so again, all of this is to understand what you're walking into and um, to be able to negotiate the, the, the best deal for you uh, so that you can be successful. Your success is the university's success. So keep reminding them of that as you negotiate through. Um, be strategic. So I would try to keep your classes every year. Ask if that's common practice. Uh, it reduces the design work that you would have to do for a course in any prep time uh, for you moving forward. And I would be careful about team teaching with senior faculty. Um, for one thing, you know, they, they may try because they're traveling a lot. You may end up picking up a lot of the load, perhaps. Um, and, you know, you want to try to balance that a little bit, um, but you also want credit. If you're just like, you know, out of the gate, you're doing amazingly well, um, then you definitely want, want to have the credit for, for your teaching excellence in that regard. So I would be careful about doing this initially, maybe a little bit later on, okay? So again, um, usually a department head will have in his or her mind an idea of what courses uh, they are already sort of imagine and envision you teaching uh, as you step into the position. All right, let's talk about research startup. So graduate student funding, this is critically important to your success. You, you need those graduate students uh, to, to build your program and to continue to, to innovate in different ways. Uh, so oftentimes you'll see language like, you'll have in the first two years, two PhD students. And everyone's like, yes, I get two PhD students. I'm so excited. But really, like, it's still kind of vague how they're defining a PhD student and the first two years is constraining, right? So I would actually recommend that you, you know, obviously recruit top uh, PhD students, 
but make a specific designation in your letter that they're research assistantships. Uh, two PhD students could mean that, that they have these slots for TAs, for a teaching assistantship. Well, to be most beneficial to building your program, you need dedicated research assistants, okay? And so I would ask them to put the word research, to make it a specific designation as a research assistantship. Um, I've had a lot of colleagues who were under the impression uh, that these were research positions, but in actuality, um, come to find out they're actually teaching uh, slots. And so they, you know, they have a student now who's not able to provide the same level of support that they really need to kickstart their program. Um, sometimes you'll, you'll hear comments or emails, you might get, oh, all of our slots are research assistantships. That's fantastic then all they have to do is slide that extra little word in there into your contract letter. If, if, they, all, if they all are, then that's great. Um, just that extra little, little word in there would, uh, would make you feel more comfortable moving, moving forward. So you want it in writing. You really want to try to designate as much as you can, have them define it in writing. Um, you may want to have them specify funding at a what they call PhD equivalent rate. So this is tuition fees, health insurance. Like you wanna make sure certain things are also covered for these students that are standard practice, uh, you know, in, in academia and higher ed, okay? And you also would want flexibility in use. Two years? I mean, think about it. You know, you come in and unless you've looked at applications before you arrived, you may not have a strong student that you really want to bring on board until after your first year, right? If there's a whole review cycle. So flexibility and use, you know, if you hit a grant or if you want to start your program in a slightly different way, maybe with a postdoc or something. And so you're not going to fill that slot right away. And so I would ask for a number of terms, whether it's semesters or quarters, of, of full support to be used over your tenure period, right? That way, you can use it as bridge funding if you do hit a grant, but later on you might need some funding for that student. Um, or maybe for one student, you would like to have a full slot dedicated for that student. Just consider for flexibility and use um, over, over your tenure period or certainly over the first three years or four years of your tenure track um, time frame. okay? And you can have them and they will make comments like this. They will edit the contract to add this kind of flexibility in there. So ask for it, it'll definitely help you. Uh, research startup support in terms of laboratory space. I think you should think about your research mission, the type of research that you're going to conduct and how much space you actually need and be reasonable about that. All of us would like to have a large warehouse <laughs> that we can, we can expand into, but certainly be, be reasonable about the space that you need. Um, you could even ask them to be specific about the building and room number. Uh, you could have them put it in your offer letter. Remember, this is a contract letter, um, and it's an important for you to understand that what's in that letter gives you leverage, okay? Because um, sometimes I, I've seen it happen where a new faculty member is coming on board, and the day before the faculty member arrives, you know, everyone's scurrying about to, to try to, you know, create space, to try to create something, and you want their commitment up front, and you want to protect the space for you so that you have a seamless transition. Office location as well. You can have them place um, you know, a location in your letter if you need to. Um, furniture. I know that sounds silly, but a colleague at Purdue was telling me that she was given an office, but she walked in and there was no furniture at all. And she didn't have extra money in her startup. So she actually had to take money from a project um, that she wanted to start to generate data for a grant. And she had to use it to buy furniture. Uh, so you want to ask the questions about that. As silly as it may sound, um, there are programs where you walk in and all you have is you've got the walls, right? You don't have everything that you need. So ask about furniture. Include these types of expenses in your startup, a spreadsheet document, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, printer, paper, laptop, computers. All of this you need to think about as well when you're asking for what you need. Uh, don't assume the university will provide you with these. Uh, I certainly bought several printers for my research program, uh, provide paper, and I have several laptops and computers. Uh, all of these I spec'd out and I included in my startup uh, negotiations, the spreadsheet I provided. Um, so yeah, spreadsheet. Think about what you're going to need to be successful. Um, you know, I tossed out 750,000 to 2 million, 2 million on the upper, you know, end of things for 
tissue engineering research, cellular work. Um, I'm a biomedical engineer, so looking at it through that lens. If you're fully computational, you know, maybe 500,000 or less would be better. You may not need all the resources of 750, et cetera. So this is more of a, you know, cellular lab type uh, framework here. Um, develop a spending plan for your success. So do try to think over the five years and how you might want to distribute the funds and allocate them. Um, but also keep in mind that when you're generating the spreadsheet, I had a separate spreadsheet that was mine where I yeah, listed printers, furniture, um, estimated students, estimated postdoc, estimated equipment, and all of this. And I had a good idea of how much money I was asking for. But whatever you do in the document that you share with them, do not include overall totals. Do not include subtotals. And the reason that you do this is chairs and deans will zoom in on the totals. They're bottom line driven and they're gonna look right at how much you're asking for. Don't make it that easy for them. You want to drive their attention, redirect their focus onto what you need. You want them to look at that viscometer that you need to buy. You want them to look at that computational tool that you need. Direct, direct their attention elsewhere. So don't make it easy for them to total it um, and don't provide subtotals either. Just make a list, provide an estimate of, of the value and then start the conversation with them after that, okay? Expect, 100% expect that they're gonna to try to remove items from your list or consolidate your list. For example, they'll say, oh, well, we have furniture for you. You don't need that. And they'll strike through that line item. So just be aware that they're going to do this, but push for what you need. This is that time. If you go in and you don't have the resources that you need to be successful, then it's going to be harder for you and you really may not be successful. That's not a win-win, that's a lose-lose a lose-lose for the university as much as it is for you too, okay? And we want win-wins here. So you do have to lobby and advocate for yourself. With respect to startup support, again, don't total those spreadsheets and request flexibility in use. You wanna be able to spin these out, like use until spent. You, you really don't want three years to spend it out. Uh, you don't want time frames on the spending of your startup resources. And you can ask for language to be put into your, your contract letter to stipulate um, that you have access to these funds until spent. You also want the ability to move funds among categories. Uh, for instance, if you hit a grant and you're able to buy a piece of equipment on that grant, then you can use those funds that you had designated in your startup for something else, even to hire a new student, for instance. Um, so you want flexibility to move funds from different categories. This is just an example of a spreadsheet that I created um, for a negotiation that I had for a faculty position. Um, I'm vague but specific about the item. Um, I can certainly provide quotations for some of these um, you know, pieces of equipment if I need to, to do that. Uh, so also keep, keep that in mind too in case you are uh, reasonably challenged. But I provide a unit price and a total for each of the items, the line items. But again, no subtotals and totals. Trust me, it will help you. Uh, guarantee it. Um, so your spreadsheet, discretionary funds. You want to think about your discretionary funds. Um, you can use these for like a postdoc, for benefits, relocation of a postdoc, a laptop. Maybe you want to recruit a postdoc, so you want them to visit. So you'll need some funds to be able to pay, perhaps, uh, to entice them to, to visit and go through that interview process. Conference travel for you and students. Uh, maybe you want to meet a program officer at the NSF to introduce yourself to make them aware of your research and how much value added is. Other foundation representatives, and perhaps even the NIH, you want to go down there and really get, get to know them and you know, learn about your funding agencies. Professional society membership costs, those can be very expensive. You can use some discretionary funds for those. Publication page costs, color pages, those can be thousands of dollars. Having a little bit of extra money uh, to be able to produce a really amazing publication uh, will be great for your tenure packet moving forward. Maybe you wanna hire student internships. So having a little bit of extra money uh, to hire an hourly you know, intern would be great. And even student graders. Um, you know, I did this my first year at, at Drexel and at VCU. I had undergrads who had taken the course before, uh, grad students who had taken the course before, and I paid them, you know, an hourly wage uh, to help grading, and it, it worked out really well. Okay, so just some ideas for you. Quality of life, geographic location, I think is important for you to consider. Work schedule, 
you know, when you're talking and negotiating, you want to ask questions about, you know, FaceTime, how to protect your time. Um, you know, is it okay for you to work at home maybe one day a week to write, uh, write papers, work on proposals, free parking. I always toss this in because I'm really not a fan of paying for parking, but usually the, the deans and then the department chairs have to pay for parking. So you're probably not going to get this one, but I do always ask for parking whenever I, I try to negotiate a position. And I have to admit it, uh, they do tend to giggle uh, when I ask about this. Um, housing, home searches, universities have partnerships uh, with real estate companies. Uh, so you can get that information and they can help you a little bit on that end. Um, there may even be an incentive. I know in Philly there was at one time through Drexel an incentive to purchase a home in a particular area of Philadelphia um, as a new faculty hire. And so, you know, ask about these things. On site or options for childcare, these are questions to ask uh, when you're considering the position. Um, spouse or partner employment assistance, uh, you know, might be something that you would, would want to consider talking to them about as well leave options, maternity, paternity, family leave, you know, look into their policies in this regard. If you need to negotiate an aspect of this, uh, you can certainly bring it up for conversation. Sabbaticals will come much, much later, uh, but I would look into the policies of the university to see, you know, during your seventh year, if you would have that opportunity to retool on the research side and, and certainly uh, have, have a nice sabbatical um, experience. Also, junior faculty, when you walk in the door, what kind of opportunities do you have for professional de development? Um, it's possible you can negotiate some resources in a startup package uh, to help you. Again, I mentioned travel to funding agencies, but uh, there may even be some like this, for example, uh, this type of training right here on negotiation, there may be some leadership training uh, that you could become involved in uh, that would help you uh, during your tenure track. Um, you know, development process. So investment in your development, look for campuses that have this type of culture, emphasis on supporting junior faculty, and look for a junior faculty mentorship program, okay? Just things to, to consider when you're talking about negotiation, but trying to understand uh, the university that, that you'd like, really like to become a part of. Um, inventor and intellectual property rights and ownership. Universities have policies in this regard. I, because I'm a device person, cardiovascular devices mainly, uh, but medical devices, especially for pediatric patients, um, I'm very interested in understanding these types of policies from university to university, especially if I'm looking at a new university to step to. So read, and perhaps again, another point of negotiation, if there's an aspect about this policy that you'd like to bring up um, during that, that, that phase as part of your contract. Um, and grant indirects and overhead. So when we write proposals, and of course, part of the proposals includes um, F&A or indirects. And if you're awarded that grant, um, the overhead and indirects that support buildings, electricity, all these wonderful things goes to the university. And a percentage of that then, you know, kind of trickles down to uh, the department that you're in. Maybe 20% of it comes back to the department. And you want to ask if you get a kickback from that. You know, will you get a small infusion from the indirects that come from these grants that you win? And you can actually be very specific about what percentage you would like to have come back to your research program. And again, just a point of whether you'd like to negotiate this or not. Um, you can have it added in writing into your contract, um, or at least make it in line with the current policy at the time of hire. Um, okay. And so just things for you to think about. It's uh, a small revenue stream that comes back into your discretionary fund. Uh, that sometimes can be very important to you being able to pivot your research in different directions and having uh, some seed funding to be able to do that. So I just like to underscore the importance of having access to your startup funds until you spend them fully. Um, I just, I really cannot stress this enough to you. Um, it has made me successful at two different institutions and I, I still have startup funds and I started at Drexel in 2013. And I'm able, you know, I'm able to support students and I've moved in different directions for my research program, having the flexibility that I do with those funds. And I do have specific language in my contract letter. Um, so this is a point that was a high priority for, for me. And so I'm trying to stress to underscore that to you now. 
Um, I do think, you know, it's important to get as much as you can in writing. Uh, they may develop temporary amnesia. Um, I've witnessed this personally, <laughs> and I've heard about this. Administrators, um, you know, though even an email sometimes is not enough, which is probably my next point. Um, you know, you, they're really trying to close the deal and they know how important it is to have, you know, to have this type of terminology in your letter. And it's not that they're trying to do anything, do any harm or anything bad. Um, it just may not be in line with, with what their financial priorities are at that time, right? So it's important for you to uh, be protective of yourself, to advocate for yourself, and to negotiate the resources that are going to ensure your success, which again, remind them that, you know, your success is their success, and that's 100% accurate. And so if you ask for something and there's pushback, again, just remind them, you're just trying to get what you need to be successful and um, you know, adding some terminology uh, kind of helps you to be more comfortable with that, okay? So yes, if they say, well, we'll put it in a separate email, sometimes it's not enough, like for a chair to put it in an email, a promise that will be made when you're hired, uh, but your offer letter, your contract letter, keep in mind, this is signed and supported by your provost, your dean, and usually your chair. So all three are on board that this is what's going to be offered to you and all three are on board with this, you know, being kind of representative of the resources you will have readily available to you, okay? So keep, keep that in mind. Ask for flexibility to move money, as I mentioned, from, you know, for your discretionary funds, to equipment, to supplies. Uh, flexibility in spending, as I mentioned, is also really critical. Um, you know, being able to, if you wanna travel a little bit more to conferences, you know, and maybe you don't have to buy that piece of equipment that you originally thought you were gonna, going to have to buy. Um, I would ask obviously for more than you need at first, knowing that you will end up where you're going to be in the end. So if you're estimating a $1 million research startup, um, I would ask for maybe 1.5 or 1.3 million, knowing that they're going to carve, they're going to try to sort of chop away at that. Um, and you'll end up getting down to a million, which ultimately is where you need to be in the end. And you just don't want to make 1.3 unjustified. You need to come up with a way to justify the request, um, but know that they are going to, to, to cut that in different ways, okay? Um, definitely make your, make your priority list, uh, what you're willing and not willing to compromise on. This is, I believe, my last slide. Um, negotiate in batch mode. So take four to six aspects at a time. Uh, and this would be half, like, for instance, two that you're not willing to compromise on and two that you are willing to compromise on. Uh, because that way you seem like you're a compromiser, right? You're kind of willing to, to give in. You're like, okay, that makes sense. Um, and then really push hard for the two that, that are critical to your success based on your assessment. Um, having the funds until spent is really important. The flexibility to move funds are essential factors to guarantee your success. Don't be shy. This is the time to stand reasonably firm in support. Like you need to advocate for yourself. It's okay if they think you're a little pushy right now because you're gonna start, they're gonna get busy and they won't remember, I promise you, uh, within about six weeks or even less. They're gonna be so thrilled to have you on board and that you're doing such a great job. So stand reasonably firm and advocate for yourself. For yourself. And remember your success is their success. If they want you, then they will invest in your success, okay? Um, also, administrators want to get the process of negotiation over as quickly as possible. Uh, they, 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 they have other things that they need to do. They know that the committee and they're on board with hiring you. And so they're like, okay, let's get this letter done and let's move forward and certainly get you there. Um, so they're, they're really trying to move fast. And of course, this is also to their advantage uh, because the faster they go, then usually the fewer things you're going to ask for. Uh, so my recommendation is to slow things down, um, to slow it down a little bit. That's why negotiating in batch mode is a good idea. Uh, so pick a few things to talk about. And then what they'll say is something like, well, oh, I guess you're, you're good to go. And then you can say, oh, no, no, no. I just wanted to start the conversation, right? This, I'm just starting the dialogue with you. Um, you know, about, you know, some of the things that I needed. I just wanted to share some of my, my top request. Um, and then continue the conversation, stall a little bit more, because at some point they're going, they're going to be like, 
ah, I don't have much time to do this. So they're more likely to cave on a few things toward the end. Um, and I'll use language like I'm 95% there. You know, it's just this one last thing that I really need, this one last research item that would really, uh, you know, just solidify the deal, I'll be good to go. And, uh, and we can sign this and move forward. And thank you so much. I'm really, you know, excited to be here. And so it, it's just slowing the process down actually gives you the advantage. Um, and Dr. T, I just want to leave, leave a little bit of time for questions. Yes, so. I'm sorry, but yes. No problem. No problem. Bye. I do want to, I just want to, I, first of all, I learned a lot just there. So I thank you I'm so much. I did. I did want to put a fine point on just a couple things that Dr. T said because she covered so much, um, so many topics, and I just want to make sure, just a couple big picture things. Mm -hmm. When you're thinking about your startup package list, don't make assumptions. So walk around your lab, look at your home computer, look at what software your university has. Just because your university has a software license for in vivo, it doesn't mean the next university will have a software license for in vivo. Yeah. So look at everything you're using for teaching, for research and service, and write it down. And even though it might be free for you at the place that you're in, um, oh, and we'll, we'll get to your questions too, some of popping up on chat. Just make sure you, you don't forget that every place isn't the same. Mention that because you don't know if your um, dean or chair, you know, may not be the dean or chair four or five years into your tenure process. So you may get hired, your chair may be in the fourth year of a five-year term. So, you know, just because your chair to agree with it in two years, the new chair may not even know. So really, really important to get things in writing. I wanted to put a fine point on the comment that they are in a hurry to get this done. Having been a chair, been on search committees, but you are not. Um, and so you make, if it takes an extra day or a few extra days, and this, it goes to some of the questions in the chat, you know, you may need to go research something and get back to them. Let me tell you, you are not going to lose your job offer in 48 hours because you were being a little extra careful on something just because they're in a big hurry. They're going to ask you lots of questions. They're going to try to find out if you're negotiating with other places. They're going to, you do not need to tell them. You just need to tell them, listen, I need three days. They don't need to know why. Um, I would also like to put a fine point on what she said about the money. The money for your startup package is coming from different places. Some of it may be coming from the department, some might be coming from the college, some might be coming from the university. And that money has rules around it. So the money for your laptop, that might be coming out of the university's IT budget, and you have to spend that money the first year. I'm making I, the time frame I'm making up, but you may only have a year to spend that money. But the money for the, the PhD student that might be coming from an annual allocation that the college gets every year. And so you might think that there's a pot of money just sitting there that they're going to give to you, but, but they may be giving you pushback because they understand the color of the money. Ask them, why are you, I'm a little bit confused why you're not letting me extend this money a little bit further. And they might tell you, well, this is how it works. And the other um, fine point I wanted to put on is about the students. So you do not want to have to hire a student the week that you get there. You may want to have some time. I think that is the most important thing. And so having a lot of flexibility on that and to make sure that they are not also a teaching assistant and doing six other things while is, is really very uh, critical. The last thing I want to mention is about the salary. So at some universities, um, you know, they're, they're going to give you that, that nine month salary. Some positions are 12 month, some are 11 month, some, I mean, they're all, but most are nine month with three months for summer. It is very likely that they will include your summer salary in your startup package. To the you, you will be thinking salary. To them, they will be thinking salary, fringe benefits, how much they have to pay into your, 
So when you make that spreadsheet and you're thinking, this is what things cost, look at it from their perspective. They might think that that, that six months of summer that Professor Throckmorton just said to you, you might think it's your salary times six months. They're thinking it's your salary plus another 30% fringe benefits plus something else times six months. So you may be able to trade certain kinds of things for certain kinds of things because the dollar values um, are the same to them, but they may not be the same to you. So when they're pushing back on things, it may be because where the money's coming from, or you might be asking for something that costs a lot of money and it isn't. The last thing I want to put a fine point in, ask them how much the stipend is for the students. Because they might say, oh, we're going to give you two RAs and uh, tuition for two students for two years. So we're going to give you four students. And then you get there, and they tell you the salary is $12,000, and you can't recruit anybody. And they're all getting stolen by the other universities that can offer a lot more. So make sure you find out when they put something in there that you can get a computer or you can get a laptop or you can get a student stipend. You ask them how much money it really is because they might, they might tell, oh yeah, we put a laptop in for $1,500 for you. And you're like thinking, but I wanted, I want. Hopefully she'll log Oh, wait, are you back? Dr. Bass, we, we didn't hear some of what you said because of the internet connection. Oh, well tell them that about the, the deferred start date that that's always fine yeah. mm -hmm. De definitely think about your start date and all these and when i say when i said the phd equivalent usually that kind of language will um you know will link to whatever that stipend level is for the the years that you choose to um you know support a student uh, so if uh if we have some questions well the question was specifically how far out do you think you can negotiate your start date is a year too much no a year's a year's definitely not too much uh and especially if they really want you they they'll wait uh they'll wait a year i mean it's not not unheard of if you're in your postdoc and you have a fellowship or an opportunity to to finish that out uh, they'll it'll give them plenty of time to prepare for your arrival in several different ways so a year is not unheard of. How long of how long do you think a negotiation can take before you're really dragging it out? Yeah, so a couple of different ways to, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll say something like I have to talk to my family, give you, also if they ask you a question that is a little personal, like what other institutions are you getting offers from and will you share those with me? You know, say thank you so much for asking. I, I do appreciate your interest in that regard. And then you don't have to say anything after that at all. Um, you're basically thanking them for asking, but you're not going to be providing that information. And so, you know, they need to be aware of what your boundaries are uh, in that respect as well. And it doesn't help you to share that information with them. Uh, an offer letter from a different school gives you leverage. And a little bit of leverage is always good in a negotiation, I think. Um, as far as rounds of negotiation, I think it depends. If, you know, if, if you're hitting all of your priority items, then it may take a week or two, it may take a, a three or four weeks um, to seal the deal, depending upon how many times you're going back and forth. Um, like I said, the longer you drag it out, though, um, it's actually a little better for you. Um, because if they're already into it, if they've already started the negotiation with you, then everyone's on board to hire you, and they have to go back and explain to everybody why it didn't work out. <laughs> So they don't want to do that. They just want to make you happy, to give you what you need within reason. Um, and so on your side, you know, three or three weeks, two or three weeks, it, it really kind of depends on your exchange and your, your timing with them. Okay. Um, Darren's going to turn off the recording, but Dr. T and I have a, a time for a few more questions. I did want to mention the two body problem. Yes. Which is, uh, so technically speaking, I think, it's you, a, I think it's a two-body opportunity, not a problem, yeah. but that's just me. The administrators call it the problem because they need to think about yes. it. <laughs> I think the later you bring that up, the better, but not before you sign. So in other words, negotiate everything you need for yourself. Get everything done. And they might ask you, is there anything else? Do you have any? Let it go. And then... After you figured out your startup package and all of that, 
then say to them, you know, I have this spouse, I have this significant other, I have this other, because those decisions should be mutually exclusive to the university. You should not get less because you're bringing in another person. Now, what would be somewhat not nice, and I would only do this if you're really willing to take this offer, okay? So be ready to sign on the dotted line and then say, I am ready to sign on the dotted line. Let me tell you about my partner. Let me tell you about my husband. Let me tell you about my whomever because they're going to now have to involve another group. If your faculty member is a, is a if, if your spouse is a faculty member, they have to probably go to their department. If you want to get a if for example, you want your spouse to get a job at that university, they gotta see if there's an opening. So I would recommend not muddying the water with what you need with to what their need but I tell you, if they go to all that effort and find that position for that spouse or whomever, and then you end up taking a job somewhere else, that, that extra work that they did for the spouse will upset them. And I'll tell you why, because they will have gone out of their way to bother people who are not them to do something on your behalf. And you only get so many of those chips. And let me just make this point clear. Let's say I'm a department head and I'm hiring you and we get everything worked out and we've spent tons of time. Great. But now at the end, you come to me and you ask me, oh, I have this boyfriend or this spouse or whomever. And I go and I start hitting hard this other unit. I might be using my chit, so to speak, with these other units. And if when we come back, you end up you really didn't want the job, you were just using it to go negotiate for another place, you really did have that person use some of their chips. So just, you know, just think about that. So for yourself, when you're negotiation, you know, negotiating hard, but when you start bringing in your spouse or whomever, just be cognizant of the fact that the person who's helping you negotiate that probably doesn't have any power over those other units and is probably using a lot of their personal charm and whatever to try to get that person in. And so just, you know, be aware of that.